Is it better now? Oh, sorry. Um, so we have these momentum capturing schemes um, uh, that really helps our feedback models, uh, which solves a lot of these problems. And there's a great review by Nub and Ostreichen from 2017 that goes into the details of this. Nonetheless, we still have problems, uh, especially when it comes to resolving ISM uh, turbulence. Um, here is some uh, results from uh, simulations by Ulin, Renard, and Augers from earlier this year. Um, and what we see here is uh, simulations of uh, ISM that is turbulent, and they inject supernova energy into these uh, mediums to uh, uh, see how the supernova location depends on, or how the energy injection depends on the supernova location. Um, and basically what you have here is uh, density in color coded in yellow. Uh, and if you compare, for example, this supernova here to this one, you see that just because we are exploding in a very dense medium, um, the supernova energy uh, very quickly stalls compared to this one where we have a lower density medium. And what they co uh, the conclusion that they arrive to is that the total momentum injection is quite insensitive to the turbulent flow. Uh, however, the scale of the coupling is very complex and subgrid, subgrid models do not capture this yet. So another thing that I think we will hear a lot about this week is the importance of location. Uh, here I show a picture of 30 Doradus uh, where you have different gas structure and also the star cluster here. Um, and depending on where you have, you inject energy, um, if you inject it close here or uh, outside in this medium, uh, the energy coupling will be very different. Um, because depending on your location, you will couple the energy to different gas phases. Also, we know that stars form in stellar clusters, and this means that we will have collisional effects taking place. Uh, and these are impossible to resolve in our large scale models. So the question naturally uh, arises if we should worry about this. So the thing that I've been working on in detail is runaway OMB stars. And these have been shown to be able to inject energy in low uh, density gas. So as I said, stars form in clustered uh, regions. And here you can have dynamical scattering and violent relaxations. And this lead to ejection. Here is a plot from Owen Krupa uh, in 2016. Uh, which shows the velocity distribution of a simulated birth environment. And what we see here is that a lot of the stars has velocities that are a few hundred kilometers per second. If we take this one step further, uh, we can calculate a mean travel distance that a star will travel before it goes supernova, if it's in the correct mass regime. So we basically take this velocity distribution and we weight this by an IMF and the main sequence lifetime. And what you find is that on average, stars can travel 100 parsecs before they explode as supernova. And this is a really large distance. This means that not only can the stars leave the birth environment, but they can also leave into inter-arm regions and also out of the gaseous disk where they form. So the way that I've been looking at this and simulating this is to include individual stars in my simulations. Basically, what we have is a model that divides stars into low mass and high mass stars. And for the, all the results that I will show here, uh, this threshold has been set at eight solar masses. And basically, what we do is that when we start forming stars in our simulations, uh, low mass stars, so the low part of the IMF, and we clump them together to the uh, typical star particle treatment that we have. But for all the high mass stars, so all the stars above eight solar masses, we realize them as individual star particles with their own feedback schemes and um, enrichment schemes. So I have in implemented this model into the uh, AMR, AMR code Ramses. And this is one of the first simulations that I ran. This is a cloud of uh, 10 to the 5 solar masses, roughly. Um, and I've simulated that both with runaway stars. This is where I uh, add the velocity distribution to the high mass stars. So I kick them out of the, uh, where they are born. And here is when I don't add any extra velocity to them at all. And this is in a way mimicking the typical star formation, uh, star particle routine that we, typically, that we have. 
So here I show density, I have temperature, and here is the distribution of star particles so that you can just see the difference. So immediately we see a huge difference in the star, star distribution. If we don't add this velocity uh, distribution, then all the stars will very quickly just gather on, on top of where they're formed. And this is because we cannot resolve any of these collisional dynamics in our simulations. But when we add these um, velocity kicks, we distribute the stars around the birth environment. And interestingly, if you look at the temperature plot, you will see that a lot of fireworks start going off in these low density regions. And as I said before, this, the energy from these supernova will couple very differently to the gas. So I did a more realistic simulation as well. Um, this is an isolated Milky Way disk. As I said, I'm using the N-body and AMR core Ramses from Tessier in 2001. Um, and the initial conditions that I've been using is those of the Agora simulation, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, uh, if you're not familiar, then uh, this is a exponential disk that has been uh, inserted into an NFW halo, which is roughly 10 to the 12 solar masses. And I've been using a gas fraction of 20%. Um, so the box that I've been simulating is 600 kiloparsec. And I go down to a maximum resolution of 9 parsec. And here I show uh, three different mosaics of uh, projection plots, one for the luminosity, one for gas, and one for temperature. And if we start by looking at the luminosity, we see that the uh, simulation with runaway stars is not so much different from the runaway stars. So we don't mess up the galaxy too much. You do see some stars in the interarm regions, and you also have a more uh, vertically distributed uh, population. However, if you look at the gas, especially on the uh, edge home view, uh, we see a significant difference here. We are driving a lot more gas out from these galaxies. Also, if you look at the temperature, the uh, temperature in between the spiral arms is a lot hotter, thank you, uh, compared to without runaway stars. So to give you a bit more uh, details on what is going on here, I will show you these two movies. This is the uh, face-on view of the simulation, and this is the gas density that I'm showing here. And this with runaways and this without runaways. Now what I want you to pay attention to is that when you kick out the stars into these interarm or low density regions, you very quickly start to blow up bubbles. Um, and eventually, you actually shred the, uh, most of the gaseous disk. And this is in a very short time. This simulation has been running for 200 mega years. And you can already see a big difference between the two. Um, and if I look at this a bit more quantitatively, here I show the star formation rate as a function of time. Uh, in solar masses per year. Uh, the red one is the simulation without runaways, and the black one is with runaways. And you can see that they are very similar in the beginning, and in the end, they sort of uh, uh, split up a bit. But if you instead look at the vertical outflows rate, which I show here, so this is the average um, mass loss in the vertical direction that I've computed by taking the mean between 10 and 40 uh, kiloparsecs you see that it's significantly increased when you include runaway stars. And this is because you have these supernova going off in low density regions that are really starting to push out the gas th from the galaxy. Now, if you combine these two, uh, you can find that if you have runaway stars, then you can increase the mass loading factor by a factor of five. And what this does to a galaxy in the long term uh, would be very interesting to see. And it's something that I want to look at in the future. Um, so with that, so I'm, in the future, I want to look a bit more at ejective versus reheating feedback. So I already told you that we're driving a lot more gas out to the halo, but what we're also doing is that we're m much more efficiently heating up the halo with these um, explosions outside the galaxy. And what this do does to cooling times in the cosmic circumgalactic medium, and also what it does on the long-term uh, time scale for the gas accretion, is something that I really would like to uh, understand. I'm also interested in uh, cosmological simula simulations. Uh, with my model, I can use, do this for uh, ultra-faint dwarfs. And we will hear more about this later this week by uh, Oscar Augerts when he will talk about the EDGE project. So 
one of the things that I've been simulating is uh, this cosmological simulation of, the, uh, of an ultra-faint dwarf where I have included runaway stars. And this is preliminary work, but we find a surprisingly small uh, effect from these runaway stars. And this is likely due to um, a high porosity and very turbulent ISM. If you're interested in more of the details about this, then I also brought a poster um, that I will uh, put up uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. So with that, I'm at my summary. Uh, I hope I have convinced you that conditional effects such as runaway stars uh, can have a large impact on galaxy simulations. I have shown you that in massive star forming galaxies, runaway, runaway stars provide a mechanism for kicking supernova out to low density gas and efficient coupling and gas heating lead to a five-fold increase in mass loading factor. Thank you. Uh, so, n not really, not in my simulations I don't. So, the way, basically when I form the uh, star particles and, the, and produce these high mass star particles, I, d I will give them these velocity kicks. So, I sort of assume that that has been taken care of in these simulations already. Um, but this beta parameter here is one of the things that I consider a free parameter in my model. So, and I will definitely look at what happens when you change this, and I'm very much aware of that this is a big um, unknown in my model. Sorry, the what? Uh, no, I don't have that, sorry, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can look at that. So, um, linked to the mass of the star. So uh, in Krupa's work, I suppose you must have noticed that. Yeah, yeah. so what, what you actually see is that for high, higher mass stars that, that's in this, you actually have more stars with, uh, or the, the higher, a higher fraction that has very large velocities. And I think this has to do with the um, uh, high mass stars likely forming binary stars. And a lot of the ejection mechanisms are these, uh, um, Blau kicks where you have one star going supernova and kicking the other one out. And also in three body encounters where you also kick. But then I think it's, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, that, so that's one of the things that I want to expand this model so that I'm using. Um, so as I said, I have this threshold. So right now for this, this galaxy, I, I don't think I can push it further than eight solar masses. But for the ultra faint dwarfs, I want to push this as far as I uh, have computational power to do, basically. But then I also have to work a bit more on my model to include these uh, AGN winds, etc., for individual stars. And that's a bit tricky. I think I, need, I would need to couple the code to 
or at least dig into stellar evolution, etc., to get that uh, accurately.